Welcome to the second lecture of week one of uh, Bioregional Approach to Communities. Uh, Mark and I are here today to talk about his lecture on the Great Unraveling, which he did a, a masterful job, I think, of leading us all the way from the emergence of Homo sapiens to the modern day in talking about the way the relationships between the land and the people who live on that and the cultures that emerge uh, from that inhabitation have evolved over time. And so, Mark, as I was reading your lecture and the, um, the associated materials and thinking about it, uh, I was interested in wondering what kind of uh, uh, research uh, you've done uh, on the ground over in Asia, whether that's China, Nepal, or other places, uh, that may allow us to imagine what this process looks like in, in actual terms, the, um, uh, the dis displacement mm -hmm. of people from uh, the places where their culture uh, emerged. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's a good question, and I hope those of you who have, have done the readings have uh, enjoyed them. They're a little dense, they cover a long period of time, and they're probably um, ideologically partial, too. One of your authors is rather anti-capitalist, and, and it may be the best possible system we have. So there's a lot to think about in those readings, and we're welcome to any kind of critique, feedback, questioning of what you're reading. Um, but I like Laird's question in that I have done some research in China with a group of students here at Green Mountain College a couple years ago, and I was interested in, um, for many of the reasons underlying this course, that bioregional local knowledge is important to fashion sort of future resiliency or sustainability. So my question was, do people in China still know the plants? Do they still know, um, you know, local edible and medicinal plant knowledge and practice it? Because traditionally they have. Um, went with a bunch of students and researched this and found, uh, I guess, sad news or unfortunate news. It's not necessarily being lost because you can put it in a book now. Um, you can teach it at a university. It can be co-opted and patented by pharmaceutical companies. And so I think we saw these patterns of centralization, standardization, and um, appropriation maybe even is a good word, commodification. Local folks are losing plant knowledge. Not entirely, but they're losing it a lot. Um, in part because people are leaving. There's a lot of villages in China where 90% um, of the people are gone. Um, and so I guess the short answer is I have witnessed a lot of loss of local knowledge in the ways that we discuss in this class. But what really struck me was this final point, and we return to this again later in the course, I believe it's like our sixth week, you'll see this point again, um, that I would talk to people um, and they would agree, yes, we don't know this anymore, but they wouldn't care. Um, and that took me aback. I didn't realize perhaps I'm coming from a point of view of romanticism. Perhaps we simply know some important things that other people don't realize yet. Maybe we're right. Um, um, but it was, it was disheartening and also a bit confounding to feel something so important and find people not think it's that important. Quick story, I'm in a Chinese village um, where Hanshan's cave is. This is a village of 500 people. And I'm talking to a man eating an apple um, and I said, how long has your family been here? And he says, about 25 generations, um, 500, 600, 700 years. And I said, do your children live here? He goes, no, they left. They went to the big city. They're, one's a hairdresser, one's going to college for computers in you know, Chongqing or something like that. And I said, does that make you sad that your family, your pla your family living in this place will be snapped after centuries? And he goes, no. Nah. This place is a dump. I'm glad they're getting out of here. And you know, and I'm, here we are teaching about resilient and sustainable communities, and he had no use for it. And so that's something I think, as we think through all of the, you know, the prehistory, the history, uh, all the different aspects of this, part of our work I think is ideological work. You know, trying to get people to care again as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it reminds me of the reading that uh, was referenced uh, in our first lecture. Uh, from Sven Burkertz in his book, The Gutenberg Elegies, where he makes the point that in traditional societies, the people who were most respected were the people who had, who had the most knowledge, the elders. And in contemporary societies, that's less important because now we can all access the information that we need. So it's not the people who possess the most knowledge as it is the people who know how to get the information when you need mm -hmm. it. Uh, and that's certainly something that has been a, a, a long uh, uh, 
the continuous process, I think, on the way to modernity, and it, it raises another question for me that I'll turn to you, Mark, and that, that is the question of if we have uh, centuries, in some cases even millennia, invested in this process of people becoming in some way displaced, mm -hmm. how quickly can we hope to turn that around? Oh, I, 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 that's a crystal ball question, and I'm not sure I could think about time frames. Uh, I remember going for a walk once with someone in Georgia where I used to live, trying to learn the plants. And I'd been reading like, bioregional literature, essentially, which had me optimistic. We can rediscover, we can reinvent, we can re-emplace ourselves, we can learn to live locally. And I'm walking with this person, and he, and he um, you know, was an expert on the Cherokee who had lived there before. And I said something like, even though all of this... Cherokee ethnobotany, this knowledge is lost, we can reinvent it, um, we can rediscover it. And he said, yeah, but it sure hurts to lose 12,000 years of accumulated knowledge. Mm. And I thought, oh, I guess you're right. I guess my Peterson guide's not, <laughs> not going to get me back to snuff in a couple weeks. <clears throat> and so there's that element that a lot has been lost. Um, I think some of the things to look for would be low mobility, as you've seen in our lectures. I think that Gary Snyder and other people are right. We have to learn to live in particular places um, as communities for a longer period of time. That's difficult in this day and, age, day and age. I think we have to have political and economic systems that abet these choices. Ones, for instance, that um, even down to the point of you know, regulations, heavy taxation, uh, allowing subsistence production, things like that, um, to allow these things to be more easily done and I think the other thing we have to do is not be too purist, not elevate the rural over the urban, subsistence over the market, um, even local over global. I think our solutions will be a bricolage of things beyond dualities, beyond you know, the whole range of options we have. Um, and we'll have to sort of cut and paste our way in local places and communities to do what we're saying. I think it's a big ship to turn around. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I'll, I'll do what all teachers do when they don't know the answer is and throw it back to the students and see how they would answer this question in the next several weeks. Yeah. You know, it occurs to me that the first step that has to be taken is a general um, perception on the part of the people who live in a place that local knowledge is important, that it mm -hmm. may have something to offer us today. It's not just for people who lived closer to the land, hunting and gathering, but that our solutions and thinking about how to turn our communities around to, to make them more sustainable, more resilient, um, that those decisions really do need to be influenced by our understanding of uh, climate patterns, uh, why we have the soil we have, what plants have grown here in the past, how with the projections of climate change we may be looking at different populations of plants and animals in a place in the future that um, a, a really informed vision of a sustainable future requires an understanding uh, of the past, the deep past, which is why the, the primary assignment for this course is a deep history, asking you to go all the way back to how the elements of your, your landscape were shaped. But that's, that's later on in the course. The first thing we have to do is figure out what is the, this bioregion that I live in? How do I define it? And that'll be your first assignment that you, you begin working on uh, about now. And uh, we've got a, another lecture set up for you that has to do with mapping your bioregions by creating a system of overlays that allow you to see uh, what, what that bioregion might look like. I guess one point that I would like to leave you with before we go on is that I really want you to get comfortable with the fact that you're not going to come up with a correct answer that this is my bioregion, this is the correct definition of my bioregion, but that in fact there are multiple ways of defining the place that you live depending on the questions that are being asked. And this is a point that Chris Kleiser makes in an essay that you'll read later on in the semester. Uh, the point is not to replace one map, a political map, with another map, a bioregional map, but to understand the social construction uh, of, of how we see ourselves and how the answers that we come up with uh, are going to change depending on the questions that we ask. Anything else that you'd like to No, answer? other than to the students, have fun with these projects. They're really interesting to do. Absolutely. Thank you very much, and we will uh, see you again next week, sitting uh, right here in front of the Red Slate Fireplace and uh, Richardson House. <laughs>